Hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for choosing to hang with the Pod Rats. I'm Brayden. Today, I'm joined by Christian and Hunter. And in this episode, we will be discussing episode seven of The House of the Dragon. But before we get into our review, you can go ahead and follow us on our socials on Twitter at the underscore Pod Rats and on Instagram at the Pod Rats. You can also listen to these episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Amazon Music, and watch us on YouTube. The links for all that stuff will be in the description of wherever you're finding this. And now that we got all the plugs out the way, let's get on to our review of this week's episode, Driftmark. I promise you in time, you and I together will prevail. Now they see you as you are. So at the beginning of last week's review, I commented on how I thought it was a good idea that Miguel Sapochnik directed episode six as that was kind of a pseudo pilot. And while he does direct episode seven as well, I don't have any comments on that, but I will say it's no coincidence that while episode six, we have a 10 year time jump as well as multiple character introductions and actor introductions for a previous characters. Um, it's no coincidence that this episode takes place all in one location with all the characters together and spans maybe only a couple of days. I'm not sure exactly how the time for this, um, but I feel in this episode, we have much less moments in this as compared to episode six, but we're given a lot more time within those moments. I feel to catch up with these characters because episode six could be jarring to some. We're able to settle with these characters and get a little bit more of their motivations after 10 years and what they're feeling with everything that's going on and also just get their feeling of what happened in the aftermath of episode six. And that does start with Lena's funeral. I, I don't know the exact amount of time we spend in that environment, but I feel a good chunk of the episode is literally just characters all in one location and just seeing how they react to Lena's death for one and also just events that happened in episode six. So, yeah, like you said, um, in this episode, it is kind of a much slower pace. I don't want to say it's slow pace, you know, because it still keeps you interested in everything. But it is kind of a much uh, steady pace, if you will. And I think that you bring up how it kind of gives you more time to kind of settle in with the characters and kind of really get a grasp on how their personalities kind of are and how they've changed over the time jump that we've had. I think that's a really good point to make because episode six's pace was kind of much more fast paced because they had this 10 years to catch you up on. So they kind of had to just go in this chaotic manner. And then with episode seven, it's kind of like the the opposite of that with a much slower pace. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of two character interactions where we're just having long, long conversations and I think it's a really nice contrast from the last episode going directly into this because you just get such a much more like in-depth feel for these characters' personalities. And while we haven't had like as many moments in episode seven as we did in six, I feel like six, there was a lot of moments in like, I guess if you viewed it as like a timeline and actions in that timeline, there was a lot of moments. But I feel in episode seven, the moments were bigger or maybe more consequential. I knew, I do know we have a couple deaths in episode six, but I feel everything that happens in this very much leads into uh, events that will happen later on in this season and later on into eventual seasons mm -hmm. as well with um, Rhaenyra and Damon to skip ahead a little bit, having getting married and then also with Aemon getting Vagar as well. Yeah, it's kind of like a much calmer chaos from episode six. Like there's still a lot happening, but it's it's a much more like calmer tone over the top of it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that comes off of the uh, morning of the funeral. It kind of gets the vibe of everyone in that space, you know, like the, mm -hmm. it's it's the funeral vibe. Yeah, everyone's and everyone's kind of heightened emotions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's just kind of feeling down in a way and i feel like that does just generally carry the tone of this whole episode yeah everyone's kind of throwing like pot shots at each other and stuff they're all kind of getting these backhanded compliments and in every interaction that they have everyone kind of is having those passing conversations where they're just walking by somebody and then they stop and hit them with their one-liners of you're a bitch essentially they isn't that how funerals are though 
Yeah, exactly. You, you show mean, up and you see people you haven't seen yeah. in a long time. And, and then, there's those awkward moments where like you have those, you know, where you may not essentially like that person. Yeah. So you put on that face of, I'll just give them this sly compliment or this, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, there was a lot of emotions in that funeral, especially for the kids. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you really felt bad for the kids in that funeral. Yeah, I mean, you see it from the mother and her grandchildren's perspective with Rainey's going over to Bela and Lena. Raina? Bela and Raina. Yeah. And uh, there's just a lot of emotions that you would expect to be felt from someone losing a mother and a daughter. So, And I guess it's very good timing for Sir Harwin to die, too, because... <laughs> Because Jace is just mourning his father, but everyone thinks yeah that he's crying about. Everyone thinks he's sad about this funeral, but nah, he's just trying to mourn his dad, man. Mm -hmm. Which Luke doesn't really understand as well as Jaceris that Harwin was their dad, I don't think. No, I don't think Luke knows. I don't think so either. But yeah, we did get in the last episode that uh, Jaceris did figure it out, and I feel like he's definitely mourning at this funeral, mm -hmm. when he talks to Rhaenyra and he's like, why aren't we at that funeral? Yeah. And she's like, well, we owe it to the realm to be here, basically. Mm -hmm. So. And we're talking about emotions here and there, but like emotions really do just encapsulate this entire episode, I feel like. Like everything that happens, I feel, is just a result of having pent up emotions about one thing or another. Yeah. Um, we see it with Damon and Rhaenyra and we see it with Alicent especially. And then also with the kids as well. I feel like a lot of what happens with the kids is just them. One, that they're sad that they have loved ones that are lost. And then it's only compounded on the fact that the girls, especially Elena, Elena, Raina and Bela, uh, lose one of their dragons as well with Aemon. They just didn't capitalize on that enough, man. Dude, what a, what a sly move by Aemon. Hey, good for him. He wasted no time. He swooped in. He really didn't. He was like, I don't care about this funeral at all. Let's just swooped in, went over to Vagar and just tried to hop on. And you know, it worked. Vagar was really not a fan of that at first. I thought for a second that he was about to get burnt to ashes. Toasted. That would have been pretty awesome. Honestly. I thought he was, I thought he was gonna die too for a second. But, but yeah. That's one of the first times I feel like we've seen like what would actually happen if you try to ride a dragon? I feel like maybe we got that just based off of memory. We got that maybe with Jon Snow yeah, riding yeah. a dragon in season eight or season seven. I can't remember exactly. But that's one of the few times I feel like we've seen. Yeah, riding a dragon is pretty sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially for a kid. Like, I feel yeah. like they really nailed what it would be like if a kid hopped on a dragon. Like, the yeah. largest dragon that there yeah, is, true, too, especially. True. Yeah, and Eamon has like all that blind hope of, you know. He just hasn't found a dragon for himself yet. So he just needs to, you know, just go find one and then it will be his. So that's what he did with Vagar. And yeah. I guess it worked out for him. So, yeah, he kind of lucked out on having like the stupidity of the yeah. kid where yeah. he he didn't have to be like he had to be brave in a sense. But I don't think he ever thought he was going to die necessarily. So mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, there's a dragon. I'm a Targaryen. I'm supposed to have this. Yeah, he knew he knew the words. He knew what he was supposed to do. Yeah, and he yeah just the training. Went and did it. Yeah, it showed he got the training from the dragon pit. Studied up on his high Valyrian and paid off. Poor Reyna, though. <laughs> Vagar is supposed to be hers, man. I mean, hey, you snooze, you lose. You snooze, you lose with dragons <laughs> these days, man. <laughs> she just said it's mine and then just didn't do anything about it. So. Well, while we're, while we're on the topic of dragon owners, at the end of this episode with, you know, Lanor. Not being dead, but being dead is who's going to ride sea smoke? I'm sure if we've read the books, we would know. Yeah, but like if Lanor's not actually dead, mm. does the dragon know that? So like to get into some lore, I'm pretty sure the dragons like have some type of con like psychic connection with their riders. So I'm fairly certain that sea smoke knows that Lanor's not dead. Um, I wonder how that's going to work when someone else tries to ride Sea Smoke. Yeah, if they do at all. Yeah, I'm not it sure. It could be like one of Lena's kids. Yeah, Reyna could try to ride you know, Sea Smoke. Yeah, they've got the same blood and stuff. That'd be pretty sad if she tries to hop on and he's 
burns her yeah. to death because Leonor's not actually dead. Going from Vagar to Sea Smoke is kind of sad too. Cut to you know episode eight when that happens and since she yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Christian predicts it perfectly. Yeah, dude, I that'd be pretty crazy. <laughs> I could see it going to one of those kids though. Yeah, I think that I think that it should definitely go to uh, Lena. Raina. Fuck. It should definitely go to Raina because Vagar was just stolen from her. It's just she needs it. And her egg ain't ever going to hatch. Yeah, she does have eggs. Egg? Eggs? Egg. She's a girl. Raina did not take uh, her dragon being stolen very well either. I mean, he walks in and she was kind of pissed off. Just, Just a little bit. I think everyone in that room was kind of pissed off at old Eamon. Yeah, I think what's interesting about like this interaction with the kids having their little squalm is you really do get to see um, just how they've all kind of been influenced by their respective parents with the drama. And it's kind of that dynamic where the parents are spewing the drama onto the kids. So the kids don't really know, you know, the fine details of what's going on with their parents and stuff, but they just know what they've been told. So in this interaction where they have this big old fight, it's kind of just all that spewing over because the parents know they can't, you know, get in this hand to hand combat, but the kids are, you know, dumb and kids. So they just know what they've been told. And then you see it spew over in this and they all just kind of lose control. Yeah. I really thought that one of the kids was going to die in this fight. Yeah, I also did. I did not expect it to get that ugly at all. Mm hmm. Like those kids were, if if Eamon didn't get stabbed in the eye, someone was going to die. It's true. That's crazy. Yeah. Just over. I mean, I guess it is over a dragon. That's a big deal. But it's just like a couple of kids, and Eamon might be like a tween or something. But I mean, Eamon laid his hands on Reyna. You could tell that he was feeling himself after he got a dragon. Man, mm-hmm. he got his dragon. He walked back in, and he was just full on Chad mode, bro. He, he was. was just better than everybody at that point. And he, yeah, he was pushing everyone. He was like, well, you should have acted sooner. <laughs> well, Dracerys definitely got the best of him. Yeah. Opposite of last episode. He kind of got a little bit of revenge, a little, little bit from that fight in the courtyard. Yeah, I'm sure Jason Luke are probably uh, not very happy with their performance that they had in the courtyard. They've probably put in some extra time to, you know, get I mean, their skills Luke still got his nose broke. Yeah, he did. I mean, I mean Eamon not, was piecing up those good. four little kids, man. He, he was. <laughs> they're still not good. I would still say Eamon got the better of all of them. He was a he was definitely one v fouring them very well. Yeah, he was. No, but to compound on what you were saying earlier, Hunter, about uh, the parents' opinion spilling over to the kids, I feel like that's definitely part of what happened with this interaction. Is Eamon? I feel one doesn't like Luke or Jace. Because I'm sure Alicent, even though we haven't got a scene with it, I'm sure Alicent has told Eamon exactly what she told Aegon mm-hmm. um, in episode six. But also the Targaryen kids and Aemon and Aegon, by Targaryen is what I mean. Mm-hmm. I feel like they also have a superiority complex because of their name and also yeah. that their mother is saying that, hey, you guys are like the rightful heirs. Yeah, no, 100%. You can tell. I mean, especially with like Aegon. I think Aegon shows it a lot more. Oh, yeah. His, uh, like, cockiness and his, how he, you know, he knows that he has the royal blood and everything. But, yeah, I think Eamon also has that in him. It's just we haven't seen that come out as much just because he hasn't really had the confidence. Yeah. But I think we see him have the confidence now because he's got his dragon. Yeah. I mean, Allison is constantly feeding this to them in their ears. Yeah. Like, the whole entire time that they will be king one day. Mm-hmm. So... And we see more of that feeding, too, when everyone does form in the Great Hall. All those random people, as Hunter would like to say. The 30 people that just come in and eavesdrop while this big old beef is happening. Yeah, get in on the royal court's business. Um, But we see that when they have that confrontation about Eamon calling Jason Luke bastards. And then also with Aegon, that's coming from Alicent. And she's telling them that, hey, these, these kids shouldn't belong here. I also thought it was really funny that Aegon got blamed when, for once, he actually didn't even fucking do anything. 
Yeah, Aegon was like, wait, what? He was like, what? Me? <laughs> yeah, because for once, he he did nothing here. And it was just full Aemon. But... <laughs> Aemon was trying to pull one over on his older brother, man. That was a play for the throne right there. Hey, he knows that he's an, he's an easy target. He knows that his mom, you know, thinks that he's a hothead and she knows it. So True. So Aegon and Helena, brother and sister, were... Uh, this was discussed again in this episode about them potentially marrying each other to strengthen that bloodline even more. And, uh, Aegon, Aegon doesn't really want anything to do with Helena. He thinks she's kind of weird. She's a weirdo. She kind of is, but, um, Aemond would love to be in his position. Yeah, that was a bit odd. It was. (laughs) Aemond's like, I'll do my duty. I would gladly do my duty. (laughs) Yeah, and then there was a couple jokes about them both liking long-legged creatures, and yeah, 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 yeah. just in you know different ways. Mm-hmm. So in that scene in the Great Hall, Alicent kind of lost her cool a little bit, just just a tad bit. Yeah, I mean it happens to everybody. Yeah, it happens to everybody. You try to take yeah. a kid's eye out with a knife. It's no biggie. Yeah, she had a little slip up. That's all that happened. That was a power trip if I've ever seen it. It was. It was a little bit of a power trip. She said, I'm the queen. I have this blade that I just stole from the king, and I'm gonna go take your kid's eye out because you took your kid took mine. Yeah, Allison really does have the superiority complex. She is very much a queen and like all terms, you know, all all aspects of the term. Oh yeah. Very self righteous. Yeah. Definitely. She knows what she wants and she really does everything she can to kind of get what she wants. Mm. And I mean, she was understandably upset about her, you know, son's eye getting poked out. Mm. And I mentioned it earlier with all these pent up emotions being like a main point in this episode. But I also see, I also think that this event um, entrenches that rivalry or makes that rivalry a bit bit more of a bitter rivalry be just because kids are getting involved and kids are getting injured. And I definitely think we see that Allison doesn't mess around when it comes to her kids yeah. and definitely not Rhaenyra either. Rhaenyra doesn't mess around with her kids, but I, that just very much entrenched everyone mm. on these sides that we see in this rivalry. Mm. It is very much like a bitter one. Like you said, just because it, it's, it's kind of crazy that they're like, they just bring their kids into it and they kind of just treat their kids like pawns in their little rivalry that they have going. And like, I don't think Allison wanting to, you know, poke out one of Rhaenyra's kid's eyes is as much a, you know, how dare you hurt my kid as it is just a, you know, you're a bitch and I don't like you. Yeah. In these past couple of episodes, we've slowly seen with the insertion of the kids into this whole ordeal, how we're, it's slowly getting more and more intense and more and more extreme, this rivalry, because it starts with, you know, the green wedding or whatever, uh, with Allison coming in in her green dress, making a statement. And then now it's gone to Allison wanting to take out the eye mm-hmm. of one of Rhaenyra's kids. So I'm curious to see how in the rest of the season that rivalry be, just becomes more and more extreme in the extents that people will go to. Yeah, definitely. I want to talk about the blade that she cut Rhaenyra with for a second, because that blade is the blade that has been through everything in Game of Thrones. It's been through a lot. It's been through the ringer. Yeah, that is, that's the blade that was given to the assassin to try to kill Bran in season one of Game of Thrones. That was the knife that was, also, or the blade that was also given to Arya at the end to do that thing that she did. Yeah, that thing. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. No, we don't want to spoil Game of Thrones for you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that that blade, it is interesting how they kind of introduced that blade a couple episodes ago and just to show the fans what blade that was and how it's just continued to play a role throughout history here. Yeah, it's kind of funny because like in Game of Thrones, they kind of talk about the legend of it and it's kind of nice that in House of the Dragon, they're kind of showing us, oh, it kind of is this legendary play that's been through the ringer, like mm-hmm. you said earlier. Yeah. That cut on uh Rhaenyra's arm was pretty deep too. Yeah. It's a really sharp blade, man. 
Yeah, it got her pretty good. Yeah. She didn't really react all that much to being... I'm sure she was also in a little bit of of shock there that Allison actually did such a thing. Yeah. Because I feel like that's one of those things where Rhaenyra probably always was like, you know, they she wouldn't go that far because they used to be friends and all that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, she kind of pushed it over the edge. She spilled her blood. Yeah. The way you phrase that is interesting because earlier in the episode with Damon and Rhaenyra, Damon suggests to Rhaenyra that the high towers are responsible for the strong's death at Heron Hall. And Rhaenyra says, well, she's not capable of that. They mm-hmm. wouldn't do that. Yeah. And I feel like that scene definitely showed Rhaenyra that she actually might be capable of that. Yeah. Even though we know that Allison had no part in them dying or she yeah. didn't want that. Yeah. Cause I think last, last podcast, it might've been the last one or the one before, but I think I, I talked about a little bit about how Rhaenyra and Allison's rivalry kind of seems like it's just a, like a bitter one and it wouldn't go that far. And I think that Rhaenyra does still have, and this is what I talked about last time, but I think that Rhaenyra does still kind of have that they used to be friends thing tucked away in her brain. And she kind of obviously doesn't like Allison, but she still has some kind of hope that, you know, she's deep down a decent human being. And yeah, in this episode, when we see Allison make that rash decision to, to stab her, I think that that's why Rhaenyra was so like shocked and kind of just stood there because she, I don't think she really thought that she was capable of that. No, I agree. And they kind of confirmed that in the scene with Rhaenyra and Damon when they're overlooking um, the ship leaving and they're just talking about their grand scheme to get married and all of that. Rhaenyra mentions that she's going to need Damon's help Mm -hmm. to defeat the Greens. And I think, yeah, I think that might have pushed her over the edge. Yeah, I think that her saying that confirms that Allison's capable of a lot more than yeah. she thought. Mm-hmm. And then she does even mention um, to Laris at the end of the episode, thinking about it now, um, when I was watching it, I didn't realize, I don't think in my head, that Allison, when she tells Laris that she might need him later on, it, that she might need him to do some Something real dirty, something Some real dirty sneaky. Work. Yeah, something real ratty. So it sounds like Allison is ready to go as far as Laris went with Heron Hall and the Strongs as mm-hmm. well. And I feel like her conversation with Otto, now that Otto's back. Mm-hmm. Um, Sadly. Even like it entrenches her more into that position. And I, with Otto around, man, he, he just pulls Allison to like her worst yeah and he's encouraging i mean we saw that he's encouraging this side of her and she was you know she kind of thought that he would be upset with her and look down upon her because she is queen and she made such a rash decision but we saw that otto was kind of proud of her and was like i'm glad that you know i got to see this side of you because i didn't know that you had it Mm -hmm. he was also proud of uh young amond for taking that dragon because that's a big win for them. Yeah, it's, it's a, a big, very big deal. Big pawn in the chess game. To go back to Rainier and Damon overlooking that boat leaving, that conversation that they have about getting married and how they would go about doing it. And there was a lot of questions in that conversation. And it seems like we saw all the answers to them play out in the end of the episode. Um, just a matter of how are they going to get rid of Lanor? That was the biggest question was in order for Damon and Rhaenyra to marry, Lanor had to be dead or at least appear to be dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very smart how they did that. Uh, me and Christian were discussing it before recording, but in fire and blood, Lanor, it says that Lanor dies. Um, and fire and blood is just a secondhand account of all the events that are happening as we see them. So mm-hmm. the show is more of a fact than the books That's are. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So it's actually kind of interesting to see how everyone thinks in the books that Lanor dies, but the show is actually telling us yeah. that um, he doesn't. And it's largely believed that Damon and Rhaenyra have a part to play from the in the books with Lanor's death, and they even allude to that in their conversation, Rhaenyra and Damon. I think this might be the show favoring. Uh, Rainier and Damon a little bit more yeah. or telling, showing us to maybe pick a side 
as opposed to, because they could have just followed the book and said, hey, yeah, they were responsible for Lanor's death. Yeah. So I think that's interesting how they did that. It definitely makes them seem like the lesser of two evils in this situation mm-hmm. by not just in cold blood murdering Lanor. Yeah. They did murder this guard. But yes, but unnamed, he's not a main character, so guard. no one cares. Unnamed exactly. guard, he's fine. But yeah, you do say lesser of two evils, even though while this is a lesser of two evils, I do think how interesting it'll be going forward, at who uh, picking sides anyway, who will actually be a lesser of two evils. Because I feel like this is not the worst that Rhaenyra and Damon will get. Oh, yeah. no. Especially with Damon now in her ear. You yes. Know? We know that Damon has kind of this rash side and... That he can bring it out of Rhaenyra as well. Let's not forget, Damon killed his wife. He did. He did do that. He he's not Perhaps that great. First, his first wife. Perhaps he's a little he sketchy. Could do it again. Yeah. Yeah. He does not. He doesn't give a fuck. Right. And this this is going to be really interesting going forward. I'm really excited to see how this plays out. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of moments where you're kind of questioning which side you're on because both of these sides are kind of shitty in their own ways. So. Going forward in the season and in the next season, I think it will be interesting to see, you know, kind of how you sway between the two sides with them both making rash decisions. Mm-hmm. I'm interested to see the dragon um, battle. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't done the dragon math on battle. Well, I'm just saying, like, who has more dragons? You know what I mean? The I'm Potterets not sure. do math. Let's see. Team Green does have a big one. They have three. They have the biggest one, though. Yeah. They have the biggest one. So it kind of honestly probably is determined by where Corliss and Rainey's decide to side in this. Because if they really think Lanor was murdered, they could point fingers at Rhaenyra or and Damon. I feel like yeah. with that conversation that Corliss and Rainey's have, that it kind of tells us that Corliss and Rhaenys will side more with Rhaenyra uh, just because Corliss mentions that even though Jace and Luke aren't blood of his, that they're still his grandkids by name and yeah. that that's what's ma- that is what matters to him. So I do feel like they will support Rhaenyra just so his quote unquote heirs will have a chance to ascend the Iron Throne. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. I also think that Corliss has always taken Damon's side over Viserys. He respects him a lot more, yeah, I feel. Yeah, he does respect yeah. Damon. However, with this quick turnaround of Damon and Rhaenyra getting married so quickly after this death, it's gonna I think it'll make him question and I don't does Corliss have a dragon? I'm not sure if he does, but I know Rhaenys does. So that that's at least a dragon at stake here. I'm sure Rainey's will definitely question it. Corliss, maybe he might just turn a blind eye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know. It'll be interesting. But uh, we also get that next week will be the final time jump of this season. And we will remain in next week's timeline for the final three episodes. So, excited about that. No more time jumps. No more time jumps. We're going to actually get to see some We're shit settled go in down. For once. We get some continuity. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to get some grown-up kids and some grown, grown-up adults. They're going to be some old asses. Maybe Viserys will be dead by now. Who yeah, knows? I'm curious to see what Viserys will look like in this time He's jump. just completely bald. <laughs> he looks like that SpongeBob character asking for chocolate. Yes, yes. He's <laughs> just being pushed around in his wheelchair, all shriveled and crusty. <laughs> all right, well, I think that about wraps up this week's episode. With that being said, we'll be back next week for episode eight of House of the Dragon. Until then, put yourself first and take care of each other. Bye, guys. See ya.